Hey everyone, and welcome to the 32nd episode of The Liam McCollum Show. I want to say thanks to anyone who's listening to this right now. It means a lot. Please like, share, and subscribe to me on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. I believe we're also on Stitcher. Anything really helps. Leave me a review on those platforms as well. It's kind of been difficult to keep the show going while I'm going to school here. It's definitely the busiest school year that I've had so far. A ton of papers to write last week and presentations to prepare. But yeah, I'm trying to keep this podcast alive and do interviews every once in a while to supplement my education and for any of you guys who are actually listening right now. So please give me some support. It means a lot. I I know that you guys are out there. I can see the analytics. So thank you guys for tuning in. Today I have Germinal Van and Jean Philip on the show to talk about their new book, The African Nobel Prize. Um, And considering that this week the Nobel laureates are being announced, figured that I'd have them come on and talk about their proposal. It's a very interesting book. They're super intelligent guys. Very interesting to hear them speak, um, just the way their mind works. It's it's uh, it's really interesting and to see how they play off of each other, it's, it's really good. So figured I'd bring them on. Also, Germinal has been on the show before and if you're interested in more of his background, please go listen to that episode. I'll link to it below. Whatever platform you're using, you can look in the description and you should be able to find the link to that episode Episode, as well as everything else mentioned in this episode, including the book if you want to purchase it on Amazon. Also want to let you guys know that the connection gets a little spotty every once in a while, but just bear with us. Um, I don't think you actually lose any content. And if you prefer the video medium and you're listening to just the audio right now, uh, I am posting the video interview on YouTube, so you should be able to find it there. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is a longer format interview, so I hope you enjoy the whole thing. Here it is. Montana and Johannesburg. I um, love the yeah. couch. I love the couch. <laughs> Thanks for technology, actually. 50 years ago, it would have never been possible, even never. to dream about. Never. Yeah, seriously. Well, yeah, um, I really appreciate you guys joining me. Uh, Germinal, you've been on the show before, uh, but Sika, welcome. Um, if you guys want to introduce yourselves, I know Germinal, uh, for people who haven't listened to the previous episode, uh, do you want to just give a brief background and then uh, Sika, you go afterwards? Okay. okay. Sir. Uh, well, first of all, thanks, Liam, for having me back on on your podcast. It's always an honor. I know you even uh, have an interview with a libertarian presidential candidate. Um, so I am very happy to be here. My name is Jeremy Van. For those who do not know me, I'm a political scientist, economist, and scholar from the Republic of originally. I moved to the United States um, about 10 years ago with a student visa. I came to study political science. I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in the field. And I became an author after trying to go to law school and failed to get into law school. And um, just a little anecdote, John Philip and I, we went together. Uh, we, 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 we've been friends for a very long time. It's funny because at the time I didn't really like him. <laughs> I didn't really like John Philip when we were in high school, but we always respect and appreciate each other. He was just too good at soccer. He was always beating me, so he, he, he used to irritate me for that. But he's been a very good student. I wasn't a very good student at all. He's always been good at what he did. And uh, so uh, I, I decided to write about politics and economics because that's, been, that's what I've been passionate about, specifically economics, something that I've never studied. I'm taught in the field. I started initially from a philosophical uh, background. I, I think like learning economics from a philosophical background is very, very important to understand the ideas and the history of economic thoughts. But um, I've been more interested into applied economics, and that's where I tension with people who support praxeology and anarcho-capitalism. And because I think when it comes to applied economics, you need numbers, you need um, uh, mathematical modeling. No one is saying that those things are perfect, but it gives a more accurate um, and approximate answer to the truth rather than verbal reasoning. But so that's why I got into um, technical economics, and since then I've been I've been thriving in the field, and we and I've been writing about it pretty much. 
Yeah, great. And then now, Sika, if you want to give your background, that would be awesome. Yeah, sure. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Liam, for having me here. Um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity that you're giving me to present myself to the audience, uh, particularly, but also to the international audience. My name is Jean-Philippe um, Sika Ado. I'm also from uh, the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. I actually immigrated in South Africa in 2015. Uh, where I actually completed my postgraduate studies in law. Unlike Germinal, I actually made into the, the law the law the law school. <laughs> so my, my PGD, my postgraduate diploma in commercial and business law. And I completed a second uh, postgraduate degree which was my LLM in corporate law with a specialization in merger and acquisition. Uh, that's actually me, academically speaking. Um, professionally speaking, I am also working as a research manager for a think tank, which actually specializes in housing finance, um, affordable housing finance to be more accurate. So that's a, this is actually what I do for a living. Uh, a bit of uh, personal information, I am the last born um, of a family of five kids, and all my siblings are actually based in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. So this is what I can tell uh, briefly uh, about me. Intellectually speaking, um, I did a lot of research in, 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 in housing finance. Since I've been working in that sector for three years now, I, I released a working paper on the importance of microfinance in, 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 in Cote d'Ivoire. How can we best understand microfinance um, in, a, in a developing country and use it as a the tool to stimulate access to finance. So that was actually my one of my paper. I also produced a couple of articles on residential market um, and, and the rental market in Africa. Um, in terms of personal work, this book is actually my first contribution. It's my first book. Uh, and I'm very, very happy again, and I feel very honored to have had the opportunity to actually work with Germinal. Like I said, we, we did not used to be very good friends, but we were in the same class. We, we, we studied together in high school uh, for, quite, for, quite, for quite some years, actually. Uh, but I always respected him, like you like said. So when, when I could see uh, what he was doing from an intellectual perspective, the amount of work he was doing, the, 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 the writing that he was actually uh, putting available to the market, I told myself that it would be a great, um, a great idea to actually uh, try and do something. And on a bit of a personal note, it has also been a bit of personal coach to me. Because uh, to be honest, I was very reluctant in writing a book, but Germinal always believed in me. He said that uh, based on the potential that he's, he's seeing uh, like on me, it would be interesting to actually put something out there to also with my own words. So I also have to, 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 to acknowledge uh, his personal uh, contribution and his personal support. So this is actually in a nutshell uh, who I am and what I do. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's really great to hear. Um, I'm just curious, you guys, in the preface of your book, you talked about how you were talking about geopolitical, um, how geopolitics is going on in South Africa right now, or just Africa in general. Uh, do you guys agree politically? Where do you guys stand? Are you, is that why you, were, you weren't great friends? Jean-Philippe, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. I think that politically, we don't really agree but we also don't really disagree. Um, from an economic perspective, Germinal is a proponent of a free market. I am a proponent of uh, a moderate free market. In other, in other terms, I am a proponent of 50% um, government participation in regulating the market and 50% um, self-regulation uh, from the market itself. From a political perspective, I think I'm also moderate, a moderate person. I, I believe I believe in the rule of law, definitely, and I think that's where we agree, Germinal and I. But um, when it comes to the implementation of democracy in Africa, I have a, a very uh, context-based approach. I believe that every African country should be actually afforded the right to choose uh, which political uh, system can work best for them. Mm. I do not believe in, in, in international um, dictatorship saying that 
every country should have the same and unique model of political system. So this is actually my view when it comes to politics. And um, of course, I think the last point that I could make is that we both, at some point, we both wanted to become next president in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. But I think uh, with time now, we, we gave it another thought and another consideration because we came to understand that there's actually various ways to helping your country and your continent. You don't really have to become president. I mean, if that's part of your destiny, then so be it. But if it's not, even as an academic, as an intellectual, as, as a sportsman or as, a, as an artist, as, as a person, as an individual, you can, you can always try and do something to actually improve the political landscape in your country and in your continent. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and I really want to get into the book after this, but I am wondering how, what is the geopolitics like right now over there? Is it, how are they dealing with the coronavirus and what's, what's going on? Um, are they handling it much like the U.S.? Um, that's a very good question. I think, to be honest, I'm going to try and give you like a quick snapshot of the, the state of, of the regulation uh, with regard to coronavirus. In the whole continent, in the whole African continent, we can see, unfortunately, that coronavirus has negatively impacted the economic growth of, of most African countries. And the reason is pretty simple. Unlike developed countries, you will see that in Africa, most of the economies are actually trading economies instead of industrialized economy, which means that majority of the, of, the, of the national revenue is actually coming from the selling or the importing of national resources. And unfortunately, the coronavirus are actually uh, negatively affect the interest rate because most of African countries uh, do not have sorry, strong currency. Uh, they, they, they do have a pretty weak currency. So when you take that into consideration and you have to go and buy or even sell your product uh, with using international currency, you take a very a big, a big hit in terms of, 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 of inflation, uh, interest rate and, 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 and changing rate. So these are actually very bad for the economy uh, in a nutshell. From, uh, from a sector perspective, what I can say is that uh, you have a sector like the banking sector, for instance, um, to actually be able to sustain themselves, most uh, central bank had to actually decrease the interest rate to, to actually um, allow uh, commercial banks and other institutional uh, banking institutions to, to be able to, to, to operate. Because based on the current situation, like I said, the economy is actually um, underperforming, and based on also the moratorium that, that that actually currently apply on loan payment, it's very difficult to actually maintain the current or the past um, level of interest rate. So most central bank had to actually decrease the interest rate in order to uh, to stimulate the the, 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 the the some sort of economic economic growth and financial growth into the banking sector and you can also see the same trend in in, in terms of remittances in Africa uh, a lot of African countries have uh, have actually uh, a level of remittances that is very high it's sometimes to some extent it's actually higher than foreign um, direct aid so uh, unfortunately, uh, the coronavirus also uh, negatively impacted the, the level of remittances because mm -hmm. you have uh, the African diaspora that actually used to send money back home. Uh, for some reason, they, ca they cannot do so because some of them have been retrenched or whatever they can. Unfortunately, the recipient in Africa cannot receive the same amount that they used to receive based on infl inflation rate and interest, um, interest rate uh, increasing or decreasing uh, based on where we're actually putting yourself. So in a nutshell, this is what I can tell you with regard to the impact of the coronavirus. Uh, with regard to South Africa, where I live, I can say that uh, overall we have um, more than 600,000 um, COVID-19 uh, cases in this country. We also had uh, slightly uh, more than 17,000 deaths due to COVID-19. But I think on a good note, we've been able to test uh, over 4 million people and uh, we have a pretty good recovery rate. So I think we're entering into a very, very good um, um, uh, context post-COVID-19 or even um, during COVID-19.
Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't think a lot of people hear about, you know, other countries. I think yeah. people are focusing on the United States within the United States right now. And I think it, they kind of need to pay attention to what's going on in, in the rest of the world as well. So I appreciate that. But to get into your, your guys' book, um, Germinal, this is your 15th. Is that correct? Yeah. And this is your debut, Sika. Um, will yeah. you just will you just kind of give a background and say, like, what motivated you to, what motivated you to write this book? Well, Sika, if you want to go ahead, I'll let you speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for the honor. I don't want to hijack the whole presentation. No, but... no. So, Liam, um, the, the reason are actually uh, pretty simple. We had a lot of a lot of reason, but I'm going to maybe present with you, uh, present you, sorry, uh, three reasons. The first one was actually to promote the development of science and a better access to education. And the reason why we say that is actually because during our conversation, we could see that 60 years after most African countries gained their independence, the state of access to education has not reached an optimal level. And this is my personal view, and I do believe that this is our view because we actually did a bit of research. And we could see that for countries such as Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, you have a literacy rate that is actually below 50%. Um, uh, and we're talking about countries that are supposedly major African country. For instance, Cote d'Ivoire has, has had an economic growth of 8% for the past 10 years. And without the COVID-19, the economic growth forecast was actually the GDP at 9%. So you can see that we're talking about very big country. We also have Senegal, which, uh, which has an economic growth of 6 to 7%. But unfortunately, the literacy rate is actually below 50%. So the reason why we decided to write the book, we wanted to ask ourselves, what is the reason why 60 years after majority of African countries gained their independence, there's still a very low level of literacy rate in Africa? That's the first question. The second question is also based on the fact that we've seen uh, for the past couple of years that development agencies, uh, DFI, such as the World Bank, IMF, been, they've been also promoting access to education. They've been promoting the, the, the importance of developing science in Africa. But still, the literacy rate in Africa is still is low. So what is actually wrong or what is not working? Because from an advocacy perspective, we can think or we can say that everything has been done. We have political politicians that are actually aware of the importance of education. We have the international community which has been uh, supporting and promoting um, access to education and science in Africa, but nothing has been uh, really done. So we were looking at another perspective, an innovative way to actually promote education and science. And that's the reason why we wanted to actually write this book, to, to tell the, the readers that in a context or in a society such as Africa, where unfortunately the literacy rate is very low, but we do have some, there's still hope when it comes to the economic growth. There's still hope when it comes to access to information. And it's very important to sit down and think about innovative ways to, um, to refresh the, the, the debate, to restart the debate around access to science and access to and development of education. So this is actually the first reason. The second reason is actually based on the interpretation of the impact of the Nobel Prize in Africa. And I know this is a very um, challenging uh, topic. We also wanted to actually assess the Nobel Prize because based on our research, most of the literacy, the, the literature that actually was available in terms of the, of the Nobel Prize were liter literature written by westernized people. And we wanted to also provide an African viewing and, 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 and understanding of the Nobel Prize impact in Africa. We wanted to look at it as an international prize with an inclusiveness uh, mandate 
to try and understand how such a price can or could have actually been an asset in promoting education and science in Africa. So this is actually the second reason. And the last reason was to also promote the need of creating strong institutions in Africa. And this last point is very important, very critical. We believe so. Because President Obama used to say during his presidency that Africa needs strong institutions. He's not the first one. We heard the discourse from very important and influent people. But in my view, in my understanding, I think that these people were stressing more the political side of having stronger institutional or stronger institution instead of stressing the social need of having strong institution uh, in Africa. And that's the reason why we wanted to actually write this book, to also say that, yes, Africa needs strong institutions, but not just in terms of politics. We also need strong institutions in education, in science, in sport, in entertainment. We need strong institutions that can actually live for centuries, that can actually promote a culture of excellence in every field. An African person can compete and can actually contribute to the development of this continent and the entire world. So in a nutshell, these are the three reasons that actually motivated us in writing the book. And I would like to uh, allow Geminal to say something if there's a need. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sika, for, um, for giving me the opportunity. Yes, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> uh, Sika and I, we spoke on the phone pretty much uh, uh, in March 2020 when, you know, COVID outbreak. And we spoke, of course, about political philosophy. He's a huge, huge, huge proponent and amateur of political philosophy. So we're speaking about political philosophy. And then I start ranting a little bit about my concern regarding the lack of representation in the Nobel Prize. Because to me, Alfred Nobel created an international prize. He did not create a European slash Caucasian prize. From, from, from my knowledge, he wanted everyone, no matter what your race, your ethnic background or your religious background is, he wanted to reward individuals who do outstanding work that contributes to the advancement of human knowledge and human progress. But there is a pattern that has been established and we see and we, we when we look at that pattern the nobel committee has rewarded people of european descent and of course far east asian individuals but especially in the sense what does it mean in fact it's important to understand is that those people who have won the prize for so long means that these are the only people that actually contribute to the advancement of mankind and that's not true that's absolutely not true. And I took it personally because I know African intellectuals, African scientists who have done groundbreaking work and they don't have visibility. That's why Jean-Philippe and I, when we talk about the book, we insist on the word path-breaking slash groundbreaking because you can do groundbreaking work, but if you do not insist on it, if you do not give visibility to your work, it will die. And you have a lot of Africans who have done that and they don't, they never got recognition. But the problem is not just about rewarding just Caucasians or um, Far, East, Far East Asian people, but also the people who work at the same institutions all the time. What are these institutions? The Ivy Leagues, University of Chicago, University, uh, Stanford University, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Sorbonne. So you see all these big, academic institutions in the West. But what about the guy who is working at the University of Nairobi? He has done groundbreaking work. He doesn't get a chance to win it too? Because here's the thing, Liam, the thing to comprehend here is that imagine the Nobel Prize, the institution that is supposed to bring light to the underdog. Imagine he, that person wins. What is going to happen? The school that he works for we will have unlimited funding for research. Enrollment uh, rate will increase because many people will want to, to go to school there. So you see, like, 
just the country itself will become an attraction for intellectual activity. Let's say there's an economist living in Montevideo, Uruguay. The guy has done groundbreaking work to develop a mathematical model that will that can enable economic growth somewhere. But because that person doesn't work at the University of Chicago or at Yale or at Stanford or at Harvard or at, I don't know, Brown University, because he doesn't work there, his work has no value. Do you think that? I would say not, no. Exactly. That's my point. So, 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 Sika and I were like, okay, it's, it's, since those guys who are supposed to bring to light the underdog are not doing the job, we're going to propose our own prize. Let's be bold. And Sika was like, why don't we write a book about it? And I was like, are you sure you're willing to commit to that? I mean, you've seen my work. Like when I start something, I go to it and say, I'm a man of my word. Let's do it. Yeah. And um, I made a note. I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, Go, obviously Nelson and I were, Oh, what were you saying? You can keep going. No, no, no. no. I, I, I was saying that Sika and I, I, I knew that Sika was a man of his word because when we commit to it, Sika and I, we were speaking every Sunday. We, we have our schedule. We're both regimented people. We were talking. When we can't, we say, hey, I can't speak this Sunday, but we make up for it. We, we speak on Tuesday. That's why we even talk on Tuesday today. Because Tuesday is, for instance, at the day where he's pretty much available. So we made sure that we work on this every weekend. When we speak, we say, okay, what have you done? He sent me the work, I proofread it, I send mine. And we collaborate that way. In six months, we're able to, to create a conceptual framework that would give a basis, a foundation for the creation of an intellectual prize for the African people. I don't, that's what Sika and I would say, like, there are probably people who, who emitted the idea of creating a continental prize for the continent, like of the caliber of the Nobel, of course. We don't want to say, oh, no one did it. This is too arrogant. No, we're sure that some people did it. But we did not see, at least to our knowledge, we did not see anyone who materialized, at least theoretically, who materialized that idea on paper. And we did it here in this book. We put it in here. So if someone, if someone wants to go on Amazon and look for African Nobel Prize, this book will pop out. Yeah, great. I did, I've done that before. I didn't see any before this book was published. I didn't see any. This book is right. there. Yeah, that's awesome. Groundbreaking work. Um, and to put it into perspective, uh, so like Nelson Mandela, obviously he won like the, the Peace Prize. But do you know of any, any African who has won the Science Prize, Scientific Prize? Yeah, Sika, you go. Yeah, definitely. That, that's a very, that's a very interesting question. Um, to answer your question, I would say yes. Uh, I'm going to give you like a bit of background. Um, the Nobel Prize was actually, um, or was created in 1901, so which means up to now, it has been over 100 years that the Nobel Prize um, has been created. And he actually rewarded over 500 people. And I'm going to ask you like a, a very small question before I answer your question. Just take a guess and tell me in terms of number, how many African laureates do you think have won the Nobel Prize in the whole uh, six categories? Just take a guess. And you're supposed to guess it wrong. And you said, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And you said yeah. five. 500 over, have been yeah, over 500 over in 500. Like, overall number. So just take a guess. Give me the first number that comes up in your mind. I would say 150. Thank you. You're far too kind. But unfortunately, I'm going to tell you that it's actually less than 30 people. We only had 21 Africans who won the Nobel Prize. And when I talk about, when I say Africans, it's very important because in the book, like I say to Jeremy and like we, we say to any person who actually interviewed us, we said this book was not written from a complaining perspective. We did not just wake up one morning to say, oh, we want to, to complain about the fact that there's, there is actually an underrepresentativeness of African at the Nobel Prize. No, 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 no. That wasn't the idea. The idea was to do a scientific 
work with our resources to do a scientific work and to put out a rational and an intellectual proposal. So to coming, coming back to your question, we only had 21 African people who won the Nobel Prize. And if you were to do actually a quick search on Google, you will see that the number, the maximum number can actually go to 25. And the reason why you're actually going to find 25 is because in Google, they also include some French people into the number of African people who won the Nobel Prize. And I'm going to tell you why. Like the Albert reason, Camus. Exactly. The, and the reason why Google will tell you that a Nobel laureate like Albert Camus is African is because he was born in Africa. So I'm going to ask you another question. When we talk about African, Africanness or Africanicity, are we talking about place of birth or are we talking about your citizenship or your nationality? Because I can easily be born in the United States and I will never get American citizenship. Does it mean that if I win a prize, am I American? Or is Germany an American? That's a very critical question we need to address and we need to answer it like from a very rational perspective. Mm. And like I said again, it is very important to understand where we're coming from. We did not write this book to complain. We yeah. wanted to put a scientific tool out there for people to understand that it has nothing to do with our skin color. We just wanted to put and to actually contribute to the debate. So when you have people like Albert Camus that actually that are included in the number of African laureates, personally, I think this is wrong because they're not African. They may have been African from an origin or place of birth perspective or from a cultural perspective or from even from a heart perspective. And I give you an example. I am from Ivory Coast. Maybe I like American culture. I really like the United States of America. So I can identify myself to some American vibe, to some American, uh, the way of the lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, from a rational perspective, do I have a pa an American passport? Am I an American citizen? I am not. Therefore, even if I win something, I think it's wrong to claim that I am American just because I like American culture. And this is actually what they did with Albert Camus and mm -hmm. people like him who actually won the Nobel Prize and were actually considered as African. And we disagree. And we say that in the book. And we say that we disagree, not that because we wanted to actually exclude other people who want to identify as African. That's not the objective. We respect that and we encourage those people. Those people who want to support African people, those people who want to support African culture, promote African culture, promote African intellectual, we support them and we embrace what they're doing. But like I said, the book is a scientific book and we need to, to actually use an objective and a rational argument if we want to talk about something. Therefore, that's the reason why we chose the nationality element and the citizenship element. So I'd like to, to add something, actually. Yes, go ahead. I'd and like then to add something to Jean-Philippe -Jean uh, Jean analysis. In fact, that's why Jean-Philippe use his legal skills because it's a it's quite a technical debate as jean philippe said it's not because you were born in africa that you're african to consider yourself african you need the passport here is an administrative here is administrative law speaking you need the passport but you also need to be living in the culture too because let me put it that way it's not like there are many african americans who've won the Nobel Prize, especially the peace. It doesn't make them African at all, although they're dark skin like me or Jean-Philippe. It, it, it doesn't make them African. What makes you African? In the book, Jean-Philippe substantively developed the structure of the, intel, of the African Intellectual Prize, where he said that if you want to be considered for the prize that we are trying to implement, not only that you have to be African by nationality, the work you do also has to pertain toward African culture. I mean, of course, when it comes to mathematics, there's no African mathematics, of course. <laughs> but when it comes to economics, for instance, the mathematical models that you build or you create have to pertain toward African economic growth. When it comes to African history, 
it has to be about African history. It's not because you're born in Ivory Coast and then you go study Russian history. If you study Russian history, that's your problem, man. Like you, you cannot expect to win the prize that we're trying to create because what you're studying has nothing to do with the advancement of African culture and African social development. Yeah. So that's the thing. So yeah, it's very, it's, it's quite technical in the, in the legal sense because, and, 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 that's, and that's why Jean-Philippe insists on the fact that it is a, a scientific book because let's not forget that also law is a, is a social science. The analysis of the law is you need evidence. You don't get up and make up a law just because it sounds good to you unless you become a legislator. <laughs> That's <laughs> where you can do that. Or a but, right, yeah. <laughs> but the, the law is a substantive science and you need evidence to back your argument. And that's what Sika did in this book. Like he developed a legal framework to the structure of the price that we are trying to implement in, in, in Africa. So that's why I, 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 I wanted to add to his analysis. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jamina. So to, to answer your question, Liam, um, I was saying that you've been far too kind. Unfortunately, we only had uh, 21 African laureates. And um, in, the, in, the, in the science area, we only had five. Mm -hmm. uh, we had three, had three laureates that won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and two that won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And uh, these laureates were either from South Africa or North Africa. And that's actually um, so far what I can tell you in terms of African who won the Nobel Prize in Science. Uh, if we also going to consider economic science as, as, a, as a natural science, I would say zero. No African has ever won the, the Nobel Prize in economic. But what's funny is that African institution has contributed a lot when it came actually to the development of economic. For instance, you have Nobel Prize that actually happened to study at the Nairobi Institute of Economics. And they actually... Uh, mentioned that in the, in the Nobel Prize discourse. Um, they mentioned actually the, the impact, the tremendous uh, learning that they got from their, their, their stay in Nairobi, studying economic, studying, um, make, trying to make headway in, in, in the research. And I'm not gonna give you the name. I think that's part of the, of the publicity of the book. Uh, <laughs> market uh, agent, so if you want to know I will highly recommend you to read the book and to share it with your, your network. Thank you. Absolutely. And now I do kind of want to get into, um, you guys talked a little bit, bit about like the structure and how it compares to the Nobel Prize, some like things that you think that the Nobel Prize does that you wouldn't necessarily incorporate into this. But before we do that, um, Germinal, you focus more on the empirical and the like uh, statistical side of this book. Um, can you kind of tell us what the importance of uh, econometrics in this book was, um, what you find to be so important about it? Because the whole the whole question of this book is it's not a normative proposal, right? It's yeah. you guys are putting forward a scientific basis for this. Um, and a lot of people might understand the legal side, but can you explain for the audience who doesn't necessarily know the importance of that side of economics. Can you can you kind of explain that a little more? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Liam. So first of all, let's define what econometrics is. I mean, for those who um, follow me on Instagram, including you, I post a lot about econometrics and stuff. But there's a reason why I do that because firms in the private sector use econometric models to make decisions. You know, when you purchase a product or one of their services, they send you a nice email thanking you for your purchase and they ask you how you like it. They don't ask you how you like it because they like you. They need your answer in order to know how they can improve their product or service. And they do that by building econometrics models. Political scientists use econometrics to analyze polls and to analyze also the impact of legislation. That's why it's important. And economists use econometrics to build macroeconomic models. You will never see a president or the governor of a state implementing an economic decision without that decision being uh, based on an economic. That's why the econometrics is important. We use it every single day in our lives. So it's important for people. Well, I'm not saying that people should 
use it don't use it that's fine but at least they should understand how it works it's important because that's what intellectuals and spe specific experts use to show the intellectual superiority to others it's like oh yeah like only us can do that you don't understand you know so that's why people say oh we leave it to the expert no don't leave it to the expert if it's some if it this is something if you know how to do it the expert cannot fool you that's why i decided to learn econometrics on my own but now what is econometrics itself it is simply the use and application of statistical methods in economic theory. So econo means economic theory and metrics means measurement. So we measure quantitatively economic theory. So, and we work with economic data in order to measure economic theory. And the purpose is to have a, uh, an, an empirical content to it. And the reason why empirical content is important because empiricism Jean, uh, Sika and I, we had that, that conversation before about empiricism. Empiricism is not perfect. I know I've been a strong proponent of empiricism, but I know and I admit that empiricism has its limits. But the reason why I push for empiricism is because it is the most effective method to come closer, and I insist on the word, to come closer to the truth. That's why empiricism is important but you cannot use empiricism in every single case. So back to econometrics, it serves three purposes. The first is to estimate economic parameters. So basically to understand the factors that plays into the economy. So to understand what, what uh, impact those factors have on the economic theory you're trying to analyze. The second is that econometrics helps you test hypothesis. Let me give you an example. I wrote a paper called um, Property Rights and Economic Freedom in Africa. Of course, us on the free market, we always say, yeah, property rights leads to economic growth. Yes, it does. But this is normative. We say it. When we use logical reasoning, yes, it makes sense. You say, oh, yeah, when you own a good or service, like you exchange it to voluntarily, you know, the free market rhetoric that we use all the time. But this is all, it's honestly, to, to some extent, it is speculative because, yes, it is reason, it makes sense, it is logical, but it's not because it is logical that it is true. How you prove that it is true, that's when you have to test your hypothesis. Because when you test your hypothesis and you show it, even the one who disagrees with you will say, dude, you know what, you're right. <laughs> he, he, he will have to compel to, mm -hmm. to your assessment. That's what I did. I test that. I, I, I took uh, 15 countries in Africa, the one who are the living countries in their respective geographical regions. I took their property rights index and I, and I measure it with the dependent variable, which was the index of economic freedom through the Heritage Foundation. And when I test the model, I saw that there was a positive correlation. So now I can confidently say, yes, property rights leads to economic freedom. Because the more people have access to private property, the more you can, you, you can determine that there will be economic growth and economic freedom in that society. Simple as that. So that's why econometrics is important. And the last part, of course, you, you, why econometrics is important is for forecasting. Forecasting doesn't mean that when we forecast something like, let's say, an, an economic event, the, the empirical, not the empirical, but the numerical result that we find doesn't mean that it's going to be exactly that number, but it's going to be close to that. That's why we say we get closer to the truth. It's an approximation to the truth. It shows that, okay, it will be around there. I, I wrote another paper recently that I shared with Sika about, I, I, I forecast the economic growth of Sub-Saharan Africa in the post-COVID era. And my study led, led me to, to understand that economic growth will decline after COVID. It will. In 2021, it will grow to four something percent, and then it will decline again because I forecast it from 2021 to 2025. It will decline. And the reason why it will decline is because a substantial part of African economies depend on South African economies. And South Africa has been hurt deeply by the pandemic. Its GDP fell to 
minus 16%. It will grow again to four, around 4% 4 too, and then it will decline. So when you do the forecasting, you see that there is a, um, you see that there is a trend. And based on the trend, you can tell how things will be. Of course, and I said in my, in my paper that everything can change because at the end of the day, the economy is still based on human action. You guys get it? It's still based on human action. It's not because I did that that is going to exactly happen that way, but that's what we predicted for now. Things can happen because human beings make decisions all the time. No one saw COVID coming. As, as Sika said earlier, uh, Africa's GDP, uh, GDP growth was at 8%. It was supposed to grow to 9 but because of COVID, we saw what happened. It went basically to the negative. So everything can happen again. But for now, that, that's, that's what the GDP growth is. So someone will say, oh, Germany, you said that uh, GDP growth in sub-Saharan Africa is supposed to, dec to decline after COVID. Yes, that's my study. This is what is going to be missing. We do econometrics in order for people to be able to make decisions to prevent something from happening. That's the point. The study just says, okay, it's it's declining. What can we do for it to not decline then? That's why you have economists proposing those models to politicians or to political leaders, and then they make decisions accordingly in order to prevent that kind of stuff. That's why econometrics is important. Now you guys understand why I insist on it every day on Instagram. <laughs> and um, to give you some example, um, on your question to give you some examples so what we did was that to give some empirical content to our theory we understood that literacy rate is the fundamental metric of education when you want to quantify uh when you want to uh, empirically analyze education you use literacy rate and of course literacy rate is below 50 percent many african countries so once again here Sika and I, why we did is that we pick the best, the countries that are the most advanced in the geographical regions, and we when we test their uh, the human economic, uh, the human uh, development index with the literacy rate, and we saw that once again there was a positive correlation to show that the higher your literacy rate is, the higher your your uh, human development index becomes too. That was for the first simple linear regression. And then for the multiple uh, linear regression, what we did was that we want to measure science with income per capita. Because our hypothesis was to say that the countries that are developed are the ones that actually privilege science over everything. The more your country relies on the scientific method, the more like people are wealthier because of in technical because of technological innovation and stuff like that. that. This is through science. So how did we decide to measure science? So we simply decide to take those two metrics that we test before, which are uh, the literacy rate and the human development index. Why? You might be like, what science has to do with that? Well, in order to do science, you need to know how to read, write, and count. If you cannot read, you cannot write, you cannot count, there's no point. That's why the countries that have the lowest literacy rate are generally one of the poorest on the continent, which is very unfortunate. That's why Mandela insists on it and said that education is the most powerful weapon for society to develop. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's why. So, and when we test, when we did our multiple regression, we also saw that there was a positive correlation for the two um, metrics that we use at science when we tested with, uh, with the GDP per capita. And that's how we were able to demonstrate that if society, so if governments and private um, in investors invest both in education to boost or to raise the level of literacy rate, it will necessarily raise the level of human development. And if both metrics are raised up, necessarily income will continue to raise too. So that's how we were able to demonstrate that our theory is valid and that's how we were able to predict that by implementing such a project that it will be a strong factor to stimulate uh, social development on the continent. Yeah, and now to get into the actual structure and maybe like the legal structure of it as well, um, can you kind of just 
point out maybe some flaws. I know that you mentioned them in the preface of your book, um, some flaws to the Nobel Prize and things that perhaps you would change. Um, I know you guys don't want to go too much into it so that people can uh, read the book, but will you kind of just give a little preface to what you meant there? Yeah, sure. Um, so in the preface, uh, Sika and I, we talk about Horison Hayek. And because especially economics, economics is, um, is not a natural science. The reason why it is, first of all, it has been included in the Nobel Prize is because anything that deals with quantity are necessarily mathematical. And among all the social sciences, economics is the most mathematical of all of them. And I have to admit that I treat economics as an empirical science too. That's how, that's, that's me, but this is, you know, this is like a personal assessment. So when you reward someone with the Nobel Prize in economics, it shows that this guy is the best economist ever. And I don't think that's true because at the end of the day, the person who's been nominated for the prize has been nominated by his peers. Let's take the example of Henri Poincaré. Uh, Sika knows how much I love Henri Poincaré. Henri Poincaré has been nominated 58 times, for God's sake, 58 times between 1906 and his death in 1912. He was one of the greatest mathematicians ever. He never won the Nobel Prize. Einstein won, Max Planck won. Does it mean that Einstein and Max Planck are better than Poincaré? And for your information, the theory of relativity, who created that, it wasn't Einstein, it was Poincaré. That's why when Einstein won the Nobel Prize, they did not give it to him for the theory of relativity. They gave it to him for the um, photoelectric effect because they know it wasn't Einstein. Wow. But you see, yeah, but for people who don't know, because Einstein won the Nobel Prize, oh, he's one, he's the, necessarily the greatest physicist. That's not true. Exactly. That's not true. To me, Poincaré was a better physicist than Einstein, but it's not because he didn't win it, so it's less. So you, you see, so that, that's why the Nobel Prize can, can, can be a big flaw, because it puts, it puts too much responsibility and too much um, honor on one individual as if that person has a superior intelligence to others. And that's, and that's where Sika and I, we don't, we, we, we don't agree with the Nobel Prize. That's what we pointed out. Sika, I don't know if you would want to add something to it. Yeah, sure. I think, um, in addition to what you said, the, the reason, another flow that we identify was obviously the, the international aspect of, of the Nobel Prize like Germinal said, and like even as it even actually written in the in the status of the Nobel Prize, no preference is actually to be given to a person of Scandinavian origin. That's what it says in the clause. No preference is to be given to a person of Scandinavian origin. The Nobel Prize is actually for any person who contributed to the betterment of humankind. So this is what I like to call it the no citizenship rule. And sorry, because I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a law student, so I like to turn everything into... Love, I love it. Please do. Please do. It's the no citizenship rule. And why do I call it? Because it's pretty clear in the, in the, in the, in the, in the status of the Nobel Prize. There's no preference that was given to a person based on his origin. So, like I said uh, previously, when you look at the trend that has been established by the Nobel Prize, you ask yourself, why do we have so little African intellectual winning the Nobel Prize? Why out of over 500 Nobel laureates, we only have 21, which actually represent 2.2% of the whole thing. But when it comes to American, they represent 42%, 42.2. European represent 47% of the Nobel laureates. What does it mean? Where is the inclusiveness here? So this is another flow that we actually highlighted in the book. 
when it comes to the assessment of the Nobel Prize, the promulgation of education, the promulgation of science, the promulgation of outstanding contribution is not something that should only be looked at a developed country perspective. Because if I want to be logical here, between someone who has one billion dollars and gives you one million dollars, and another person who has ten thousand dollars and give you one thousand dollars, who has done the most? It's obviously the second person because he gave you ten percent of his wealth, as opposed to somebody who has one billion dollars and gives you ten thousand dollars. It does not even represent one percent of his wealth, and this is actually the the correlation or the, 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 the picture that the Nobel Prize is creating by only rewarding people from America and Europe. Because obviously, the scientific and the intellectual there, they have better access to resources, and no one is disputing that. When Germinal mentioned Ivy League, when he mentioned MIT, University of Chicago, of course, these are very good universities. And I'm not even going to lie to you. If I actually apply to one of these universities and I get accepted, I will actually jump on my feet. I'll be very happy. <laughs> You'd be I crazy have, to not go. <laughs> exactly. You'd be crazy to refuse, to decline that, that, that opportunity. But does it mean that a person who's studying at the University of Nairobi or at my university, University of Witwatersrand, which is actually one of the best universities in Africa, part of the top 200 university, has one of the best legal school, law school in, the, in, in Africa, and which is also part of the, the, the 200 uh, uh, university in the world, does it mean that as a law student, I'm, I'm not worthy of making a groundbreaking contribution to the betterment of humankind? The answer, in my view, is no. So, mm. you know, actually, the trend that, that has been established by the Nobel Prize and this is actually where we disagree. And this is actually the flow that we're trying, the, the wrong that we are trying to right. And mm. again, I like to stress that it is not from a complaining perspective. It is very from a scientific yep. perspective. Because I give you percentage, I give you trend, I give you numbers. And if you disagree, please feel free to do your own research and contact me and tell me, Sika, you're wrong because out of the 500 people, like you said, Africa had 150. And I'll actually, for you, okay, thank you, my friend, because <laughs> you actually educated me on something I did not know, and I'm very happy for knowing that. But as far as we're concerned, the international or the no citizenship rule that was actually included in the status of the Nobel Prize, it's not being upheld. Mm. We have little people from developing country winning the Nobel Prize. And the question again, it actually, it actually boils down to another question. What exactly the Nobel Prize is trying to promote? Because like Germinal said, can you imagine the impact of winning a Nobel Prize in a developing country as opposed to winning the Nobel Prize in a developed country? And we're not saying that the Nobel Committee should not be fair. We're not saying that because you're coming from a developing country, you should necessarily win the Nobel Prize. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying at least try and be more mindful of other scientific, other intellectual who are out there. And if you're going to assess their contribution, you also need to be mindful of the context in which they are working. Because it is definitely not fair and not logical to compare the amount of resources at the disposal of an intellectual who study at Harvard University against one person who's studying at the University of Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire or University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. We do not have the same level of access to finance and to resources. Therefore, it does not make sense, in our view, Germinal and I, to say that we are only going to reward the American people or the European people. Of course, they do have the best equipment. 
they do have the best resources, they do have the best book, but that doesn't mean they are actually the smartest. It means that they actually put in an environment that help them to thrive and to reach the best potential. Unlike another person who is thriving regardless of the challenges that he has to face. So honestly, this is actually what we're trying to say here. We do not say that only reward people from developing country or from Africa. No, we're saying that you need to be more mindful in assessing your, the criteria of outstanding work. Because an outstanding work, in my view, is not just about innovation or creating the, 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 the best smartphone or creating the lithium ion battery like the 2019 um, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry did. No, outstanding and groundbreaking work can also be understood from a ratio of assessing access to resource and the context in which you are trying to do groundbreaking work. So for mm -hmm. me, if I have a person who's living in a very difficult and highly challenging society, but regardless of all the pressure and all the difficulty trying to actually succeed in doing something great, compared to another person who's living in a society where 90% of the institution, 90% of the system helped him thrive, I would definitely give a shot to the person. And like I say, it is not a trend that we're trying to establish. We just want the Nobel Committee to be more mindful in its assessment. We want them to consider the context, to consider the society, to consider the background, to consider the whole environment before saying that the people um, working or doing research at Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Oxford, are actually the one worthy of winning the Nobel Prize. That's where we strongly disagree with them. It's actually one of the flow that we highlighted. And to conclude, in the book, we highlighted five flows. And I will again recommend you guys to get your <laughs> copy. Be able to, um, to read and understand the other three reasons. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, so I think that also kind of goes to what Germinal said earlier, where the Nobel Prize was always supposed to shed light on the underdog, right? And I mean, if if they aren't, and they're only focusing on these, you know, four or five institutions, I think that that goes against what they're, they're trying to do. So absolutely, I see, I see your point there. Um, what would you say for just like a devil devil's advocate? Uh, question here what would you say to someone who's like well maybe africa doesn't need like the einstein one einstein right they don't need one einstein they need many mid-level developers to like to grow africa would you say that that's just a misunderstanding would you say that maybe there's a caricature of africa that doesn't really represent what it really is i know the the cities that you guys were born in um they're highly developed so what would you say to a claim like that so, uh, oh, John, you want, uh, you no, no, no. To go? no, no, I wanted to understand. I need to charge my laptop. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay, okay. go ahead. Okay, go ahead. So, okay, I, I guess I can start it with, um, I can start answering Liam's question. So, you see, Liam, here's the thing what Sika and I we engage ourselves in is already a big challenge because in Africa, we already have that mentality of we need the next Aliko Dangote, we need the next Elon Musk and stuff like that, which is who we love entrepreneurship. To me, entrepreneurship is one of the best way for a society to thrive. But today, the conventional or the average African citizen wants to get into entertainment rather than intellectual activities. Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem is. We're not saying that entertainment is bad, but I have to be called here, entertainment does not develop a society. If entertainment did, Brazil would have been the most advanced society in the world because they play soccer. Let me give you a very simple example here. When I used to be younger, I used to watch uh, Chinese movies, martial arts, 
Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan doing the scream, you know, doing those Kung Fu techniques or whatever. So I used to think that Chinese were only worth doing martial arts. But today, when you hear the word Chinese, the first thing that comes to your mind is what? Computer scientist, biologist, doctor, statistician, analytics, all this stuff. What has happened? The Chinese made a cultural and psychological shift. They moved from all the entertainment activities into intellectual activities. Today, Jewish people are the ones dominating the world. But why? I'm not saying that in a, uh, in, a, in a derogatory way at all. I'm just saying that Jewish people are the most advanced in the world, and it is a fact. But why? Because Jewish people from a very young age engage into intellectual activities. A conventional Jewish family makes their kids reading the Torah at six or seven years old. And reading the Torah is a very, the Torah and the Talmud, by the way, both. They're very uh, intellectually challenging books to read. So imagine you impose something like that to read it, right? At when he reached uh, the level to go to university, the guy's IQ that is over 130. <laughs> Let me give you another example. Tanahisi Coates. I'm sure you heard of Tanahisi Coates. One of the foremost writers in the United States who is a strong proponent of the black cause. Tanahisi Coates doesn't have a college degree. You know, but he's one of the best writers ever in this country. Why is that? When Tanahisi Coates was young, his mom used to make him write. If he wants, let's say, to get an ice cream, she makes him write a dictation and the slightest grammatical mistakes, no ice cream. He used <laughs> to see that as a punishment, but she was developing his writing skills. Tanaisi Coates won twice the National Book Award. He doesn't have a college degree. But today, when you ask a typical African kid, and not just African, but even Black American, what job they want to do? Oh, I want to be a rapper. I want to be a comedian. I want to be a singer. I want to be this. I want to be that. Because today, those people are the ones who are the influencers. You don't see influencers in the black intelligentsia. You don't see influencers in the African intelligentsia because the population does not value them. And why the population doesn't value them? Because government. In Western societies, you see that research is rewarded. Here, in, 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 as we say, in white people's country, <laughs> research is rewarded. Like it, we value that. But in, in African societies, this is one of the big things that we, lack, we, we, we are lacking and we are lagging on it. Like we don't value those things. You, you don't see government uh, funding research. You don't see, um, because the thing is, if the government start funding research, it will incentivize the private sector to also do the same. Because people in the private sector don't want to put their money into something if they're not sure they're going to get a return on it. But if they see that government is funding research, it, it then stimulates people in the private sector to also put their money in that research because they know that that research will get to something. So that's why we decided to write this book because we want to make people understand that a society cannot thrive if you do not get educated. You cannot thrive if you do not get into intellectual activities. The, the, so long as you will keep complaining, so long as you will keep ignoring intellectual activities, Jewish people will be over you because that's what they do. I never believed that Jewish people were naturally smarter than others. They work. They work. That's why. They get into intellectual activity. So it is important for Africans to embrace the understanding and the necessity of education and specifically to endeavor into scientific um, endeavors because it is important. Science is a necessity for development. All the means of communication we use today is science. Even us using Zoom or Skype, it is science, is even one of the lithium ion battery <laughs> that is in this thing. That's why we were able to communicate today.
So it is important. It's not comedy that is going to build Skype. <laughs> it's not soccer. It's not, I don't know. Like, I'm not saying that to, to be condescending on entertainment activities. Of course, they're important. Of course, those guys play their role in society. Of course, we need art. But I see art as a luxury. You get into art once your stomach is full. But when you're starving, you have to do what is necessary to survive. And what helps you survive is science. It's not art. It's not entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to make a comment, please do, Sika. Yeah. Please, please. Uh, I would like to make a comment uh, just to add on what Germinal said. Uh, your question is, is very interesting. I like the, the David Advocate aspect. Mm -hmm. And I think if I were to give a very short answer, I would, I would just say that what do you need to actually build um, houses? What do you need to build maybe roads? What do you need to build schools? In other words, what do you need to build infrastructure? The answer is pretty simple. You need to have knowledge. You need to have the know-how. If you do not know how to build houses, how are you going to make it? So for a person who will come to me and say, you're advocating, you are advocating for an African intellectual pride. It's actually pointless. It's irrelevant because Africa doesn't need an African Einstein. We need um, infrastructure. That would be my answer. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask him exactly. We need infrastructure, but how are you going to make those infrastructure? How are you going to build them? Because you don't just wake up one morning and be like, I'm going to to to, to build a house, or I'm going to create to make to make roads, or I'm going to like to create the battery, the, the, the lithium ion battery, or I'm going to create a laptop. You need to have the know-how. For Mark Zuckerberg to be able to create Facebook, he had a background. He went to school. He had access to education. He went into the most important university in the world. So he's not a guy from nowhere who just woke up and be like, oh, I'm going to create Facebook. <laughs> the same for Steve Jobs, the same for Warren Buffett, which is actually, who is actually one of my favorite investor person. I love him. The same for Tijan Tiam. Tijan Tiam is actually my model in terms of African excellence. I'm very proud of the man. Sika, like can, you, Sika can you give... Can you uh, tell Liam more about Tijan Tiam, who he is and what he does? Oh, okay. Sorry. So, yeah, Tijan Tiam is actually the. It's called. He's actually called a super banker. He's, he's an Ivorian who grew up in Cote d'Ivoire, studied in, in in France, and he was the managing director of Pruden, Prudential in the UK, and he happened to be the first black banker to actually be the CEO of Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse, which is one of the most, um, one of the most, uh, the richest bank, the most powerful uh, bank in the world. It's a very, it's actually in the top tier of the most successful and the most uh, wealthy bank in, in Switzerland. And it used to be the first black CEO from 2015 mm. up to uh, this year, February. So this guy is actually a genius. He is a genius because ever since he left school, he was a top institution. So the question is, how can you make that happen without education, without knowing, like, like Germinal said, you need to know how to read, how to count. You need to have basic knowledge. So if you're coming, if a person comes to me and say, Africa needs infrastructure, Africa needs development of science, I would say yes. And I agree with you. And that's, and where, by, unfortunately, where I disagree with you is actually the method. Mm. The method using, and that's the reason why we wrote the book. Like I said, development agencies, DFI, even some politician, African politician, they've been saying what you just said, or what many people would say, Africa needs infrastructure. A lot of them have been saying that. But again, it boils down to the critical question of how do you make that happen? If you have a society in which 
the literacy rate is below 50%, which means Jaminal and I, we are part of the privilege. And that shouldn't be the case in 2020. It should not be the case. I would have been very happy if I was the richest African person. Then I would understand, okay, it's a privilege, you know, because to actually gain wealth, you need to, to demonstrate a couple of skills. But why do I have to be privileged? Because I have two postgraduate degrees. Why do I have to be privileged? Because I can use my mind. I can use my critical mind, my analytical mind. Why do I have to be privileged? This is a basic thing that we need to develop in Africa. And to conclude, this is my answer. I would say infrastructure does not come from the sky. You have to know, have technical knowledge, have a background knowledge, have a, have a solid background, and know how you're going to make infrastructure sustainable ones and the one that can actually promote development in your country, in your region, in your area. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And I'm just curious, you guys, as writing this book, did you guys see yourselves as kind of like the Alfred Noble, will you start the foundation or do you want to like hand this book off to um, someone? Oh what no, are... oh no, we're not handing anything. Oh, absolutely not. No, I mean, we, okay, so let me put it that way. We did not write this book just for the sake of writing. Of course, Sika and I, we love writing. We are intellectuals. We the intellectual activity gives us the juice. That's why, that's how we express our enjoyment. But this book is a book of advocacy. We're mm -hmm. not here to play. We, the, the, the time and effort we put into this to, to implement a, a basis is no joke. What we want is to make sure that that thing at least gets started. If yeah. we hand it to people, this is not going to work. Are you going to hand me your podcast? <laughs> of course not. Um, exactly. I'm, I'm not going to manage your podcast, do your podcast the way you manage your own podcast because you know the resources you need to improve and to scale it up. Actually, on the side note, your podcast is one of the greatest platforms I've ever been. You're doing a great job, man. Keep going. Thank back you. to what I was saying. <laughs> but back to what I was saying. That's how we see. Like, it's. It is, it's not, not, not that it's our property, but intellectually speaking, yes, our property. We are the one who conceptualize this. So we have to be part of the process. What we want is that this book falls into the hand of development agencies, economic agencies, government officials, and private investors. When they read this, they're like, oh my God. Who are these two guys who did it? Mm. We want, they, this is one of the most brilliant projects we've ever seen, and we want to invest in it. It's, it's, it's kind of, this book, it's kind of, it's kind of like a business plan. Mm. Technically, it's like kind of a business plan. You go to the bank and say, hey, like, this is my plan. I, I need uh, funding for, for my business. It's kind of a business plan, but because, you know, we're intellectuals and we enjoy the intellectual juice of it. So that's why we gave the historical uh the historical background of the nobel prize and by the way like for if you want to understand the historical background of the nobel prize this is the book for you because no matter where you read the historical background it will be the same mm. but just reading the two first parts of this book you will literally know pretty much everything you need to know about the nobel prize even this morning they rewarded the nobel prize in physics right tomorrow they will do for chemistry and for, of course the people won in physics one American, one German, one English. <laughs> African. I mean, am I surprised? I don't feel so. Uh, Sika, are you surprised? No, I'm not. Not at all. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just to make sure. All right. So, and tomorrow we assume that it will be the same. So you see, you see, Liam, that's the thing. Like, we need that thing to change. We need Af Africans to understand that they need to dream and, and they need to dream high. Mm -hmm. Today, if you tell an African, oh, you're going to win the Nobel Prize, it's going to be, are you crazy? It doesn't even come into their minds. Why? Because the, the, the Nobel Prize doesn't give that 
opportunity to them. That's the thing. Because if they see one of their fellows win it, then they say, I can do it too. Today in America, a black person believes he can be president because Barack Obama has been president of the United States. That's the thing. In the 1960s, when Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, people are like, get the hell out of here with your dream. It's not going to work. No, but that was the truth. But today, since Obama has been president today, a black kid can be like, I am going to be president of the United States too. It has happened. You have to sell the dream. But when you do not sell the dream, you cannot see people devoting the time and effort to produce output. You got to give incentive to people. That's what we want. So right. Sikan and I, we are the one that is going to supervise this thing. At the end of the day, it's our idea. Sure, for now, we do. We, we see young and we don't have the financial means, but we have the head. <laughs> that, that is the greatest gift that God has given to us to create ideas and to materialize these ideas and turn them into something physical if possible. Absolutely. Sika and I, we are on a mission, man. Like, yeah. there's more coming. Let me put it that way. There's more coming for you guys. Great, <laughs> We're going to take Africa to some new levels, man. We, we're we going to do it. Yeah. Hey everyone, I just wanted to stop the podcast right here and explain my next question for the listener. I share my screen, which I happen to mispronounce for some reason. Um, I think I I think I was reading share screen on Skype, and for some reason, maybe I have dyslexia or something, I said screen my share. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but um, I, I want to explain my question. Basically, I, I share a tweet with Germinal and Sika, um, of a poster that was put up in the African American Museum in DC um, that talks about the aspects and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. And um, I kind of just assume that everyone knows what I'm talking about, um, but I want to read a little bit for you guys. Um, I want to read a little bit off of it for you guys because it's kind of important. Um, a lot of people painted it as anti white, but Germinal and Sika think that this is actually um, racist towards black people as well. So um, basically the poster says, white dominant culture or whiteness refers to the ways white people and their traditions, attitudes, and ways of life have been normalized over time and are now considered standard practices in the United States. And since white people still hold most of the institutional power in America, we have all internalized some aspects of white culture, including people of color. Um, and now the first little image they have here is of someone holding like a shovel and it says rugged individualism so the individual is the primary unit uh they're self-reliant they're independent and they have autonomy um individuals assume to be in control of their environment quote you get what you deserve they also reference the family structure as being a product of whiteness um so the nuclear family, father, mother, 2.3 children as the ideal social unit. unit. Um, the husband is the breadwinner and the wife is the homemaker. But then, for some reason, they have an image. But for some reason, then they have emphasis on scientific method. And under the bullets, they say objective, rational, linear thinking, cause and effect relationships, and quantitative emphasis. Um, apparently, this is a product of whiteness and white culture. Um, you'll hear me comment on it as being something on this poster as being something that you could probably <laughs> probably could have been found in Nazi Germany as some disgusting propaganda. Um, but yeah, definitely I'll link to a picture of that if you guys want to look at it. Um, they also say justice is a product of white culture, aesthetics is a product of white culture, status, power, and authority, time, rigid time schedules, Protestant work ethic, um, holidays, and competition, oh, and communication. So yeah, I just wanted to explain that for you guys. Um, it's pretty, pretty gross, but yeah, here's back to the interview. Um, I do actually have one more question, Germinal. You were talking about um, African Americans and uh, you were talking about kind of like their focus on entertainment, but I'm curious about you. You wrote um, your previous book was about African Americans and the current status of them in the United yeah. States. 
Um, I'm curious about what you guys think. Uh, if I can sh screen my share or wow, share my screen with you. Um, uh, didn't get have my coffee this morning, but um, here, just a second. can you guys see my screen right now? Uh, yeah, I can see it's uh, I see myself. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see Twitter right now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, yeah. cool. So, yeah, I'm just curious if you've seen this. Um, and yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, and I just want to like look at this. So it talks about whiteness, and it says that uh, you know, that it's an emphasis on the scientific method, and it's kind of like presupposing that you know, rational. So I guess Jean Philippe, I, I guess he can. I will white then. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because we use a scientific method. Is it is it necessary? Right. Is it is it only inherent to white people? And. I, I just wonder if you can um, kind of speak to that and speak. Yeah, to no, I'm, I'm definitely going to de to develop on that. And it's funny because Sika and I, we, we spoke about that. You see, this is the problem. And that's where sometimes I feel like black people in general need to understand something. Science does not belong to Caucasians. And black people need to understand that Caucasians too have been poor too. You know, when African goes to um, developed countries, they think that those things has been there forever. It hasn't. European and Western societies too have been agricultural, like the way African countries or black societies have, are, are, are agricultural too. What now has distinguished those two so that those two kind of society is a scientific method. I mean, of course, there are also other factors like colonization and slavery who have played a role too. We're not going to ignore that. But to reject the scientific method is to reject progress. That's the problem. We're not saying that if you accept the scientific method, you have to forsake your traditional culture. No, of course not. The Japanese are very traditional people. Look at India. Indian people are very traditional, but they use the scientific method to develop the infrastructures. That's the past. In India, on the street, you go around the, the cow. You don't touch the cow. That's what Indians believe strongly in the scientific method. So to claim that the scientific method, objective analysis, empirical uh analysis is whiteness this is wrong and this is and this is what makes african-american culture lagging more because to say that you do not need the scientific method to to thrive is to basically dooming that kid for failure is to basically dooming that kid to remain in poverty that kid needs education and you learn the scientific method through education to attribute the scientific method just to whiteness or to white people generally speaking is wrong. White mm -hmm. people did not create, they did not create science. Science was created in Africa, actually. You may not know that, but Africa has been the first in the world. People don't know that. The Greeks, the, the Greek scientists, Plato, Aristotle, all these guys, they used to come to Egypt to, 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 to learn. The mathematics was born in, in, in Africa. The alphabet was born in Africa. At the time, Africa was at the peak of the world. The Neanderthal man was living in the cave. <laughs> we were not at the same level of social development then. It's important to understand that because sometimes Two, I yeah. have to call white people out here because they feel that, oh, Western culture is the culture of civilization. We know, no, 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 you don't know everything. You borrowed from us. So it's important to put things in perspective. It, it started in Africa. It's, it, is, it is because racism and colonialism that the complex of inferiority in black culture started to be, started to increment. Mm. And that's what makes black people feel that they're inferior to whites and other races but no human development started in africa the the pyramids you see in egypt in fact they represent the uh, how we call it the coffin of the pharaohs that's what it means 
today they represent like uh, touristic. Uh, I don't know how to. I, I can find the word. They they represent like a um, touristic item or like. Like a touristic place to man. yeah, uh, like a touristic place to go. But those things, yeah. they actually they represent where the pharaohs died, like where they are today. Jesus has been in Egypt. Moses has been in Egypt. All the people that we pray in the Bible, they've been in in, in Egypt, in Africa. Everybody started in Africa. That's why at the beginning of the book, I put a quote here that I'm going to read to you. Is from one of the greatest scientists of the African continent that no one. Acknowledge his name is Sheikh Antadio. This is what he said. He said, No race is superior to another. They all originate from Africa and have the same intellectual abilities. So for the African American to claim that the scientific method is whiteness, this is an insult to black people. Mm. It is an insult to black people because you basically handing it to white people and say that they're superior to you. William, I have to be honest, when I was coming to this country, I never felt that a single white person was superior to me. Never. Never. I always told myself, I'm a human being like a white person, like an Asian person, like a whatever race it is. I have 46 chromosomes like this person. Only apes have 48 chromosomes. So if I have 46 chromosome like somebody else, it means that that person is no better than me intellectually speaking. That person may have some advantages over a very specific branch of knowledge that I don't, but that's it. So but it doesn't mean that he's necessary. I'm good at political science economics. I don't know anything about physics, although I love physics. I can do physics. That, that, that's what it is. We all have our specialties and we need to find what those specialties are, are and thrive into them. That's the point. So it is important for black people to understand that if they want to get the respect, the respectability that they've lost before, they need to get back once again on intellectual activities. That's the only way. That's what the, 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 the Chinese are respected today. Before people used to laugh at Chinese people. I, uh, yeah, I mean, no one used to, to respect Chinese people, but today you're not going to play with Chinese people. They are far advanced than anybody else. And by 2025, the U.S. will lose its status of first economic power in the world. The U.S. will, will become third. China will be the first. I mean, the U.S. will still remain the first military power due to its, uh, due to the amount of its nuclear, of its nuclear arsenal. But economically speaking, China will take over. And why China is taking over? Because they rely on the scientific method, because they don't see the scientific method as whiteness. Mm. See that, that as a tool of development. Absolutely. And that's and, how black people should see it too. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it was in the African American Museum in DC, it's just, it's very sad. Uh, and something that I was thinking about with, with my friend the other day is like, it sounds like something that Hitler could have said like to put people down right i mean he said that it was only white civilization who has come up with anything good yet they're using the same exact argument and i don't like i don't understand why they would why they would want to promote something like that exactly and 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 i think they don't realize that they're actually hurting themselves by doing that and you see and back to the nobel prize that's what it shows too because the nobel prize has been rewarding only white people they say, oh, white people are the only one who comes with something good for humanity. That's why Sika and I were like, no, we disagree with that. Yes, Sika, go ahead. Yes, uh, I don't live in the, I don't live in America, in the U.S. Um, and and but actually, what you what you're touching base on is very interesting, and I think it's very important. It's also appealing on my, on my on my critical mind, and and I think one of the reasons why you would see uh, an African person put out a quote like this or a statement like this, it boils down again to what I would say, the, the need of having role models in every society. Having role models are very important for personal development, cultural acceptation, and social and economic acknowledgement and recognition. The reason why German can talk today about 
science being born in Africa? Of course, it's because he's an educated person. He took the time to research on the topic, to actually educate himself and know that mathematics, um, astronomy, um, writing were all developed and started in Africa. But there's a lot of African people who don't know that. And they did not know that, not because they don't value the information or the knowledge. It's because they do not have role models that are going to promote the importance of knowing these things. And that's why it's very important, and I stress that again, it's very important in five years or 10 years, or even in two years, depending on how far the book will go, to actually create a strong audience and a strong momentum around the proposal we're making. Because it's important to have role models. The reason why you have, we actually praising, and I put, I'm saying praising in, in quotation actually, we're praising the Nobel Prize. But it's because of the role model that the Nobel Prize has created. They put out there people that we did not know. I am a law student, I work in housing finance, but today, I have a bit of knowledge. I have general knowledge when it comes to Nobel Prize, to Nobel Prize winner. I know who invented this and that. I know, them about, I know a little bit about the Nobel Prize. Why? Because the Nobel Prize, like it or not, shed light on the scientific. It shed light on people who are actually making things work, who are actually creating something good. So, Having a role model in society, even if it's, if it's an institution or an individual, it is very important. And that's something, in my view, that is lacking in Africa. We tend to think that, like you said, everything that we see in developed country has ever been there. It has not. They created it. The Nobel Prize started in 1901. It wasn't famous. It wasn't an international prize. It wasn't as important as it is now. But what made the Nobel Prize important is actually the management of the, of the, of the prize, but the lifespan of this prize. Because one person took the task to create something, something that is going to be a symbol. So symbolism is very important. Absolutely. And that's something we need to understand. And that's what's lacking in African society, in black society. Because if you walk in a museum or if you work in a black place where someone can actually put a statement like this, I think the analysis has to be twofold. Whether the person is completely ignorant or whether the person does not really know what he's talking about. But it all comes down to role model and symbolisms. Because if we had more people, more African person coming out there and, 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 and educating us, educating the younger generation, educating people, making people understand that you have the potential, the same potential as the Caucasian person, do great based on your background it will actually instill more confidence. And that is why the African Intellectual Prize is very important, because being able to create an institution like this for the whole continent will actually shed light on the whole African intellectuals. And we can actually have more younger African, more African youth identifying to African laureates from a very young age, saying that, I want to become like this guy. I told you today about Tijan Tiam, but I've been loving the guy, the man from my younger age. And it's one of the reasons why in everything I do, I try to be the best. And that doesn't mean I'm the smartest. I'm not the smartest person, but I had a role model in addition to my father who actually instilled the, 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 the need of education. The society in which I grew up, I've been surrounded by people who constantly taught me that if you want to make it in life, you need to take your studies seriously. That's why it's very important. And to me, the reason why 
you put the statement uh, for us to discuss is very good because again, African and black society, we lack a lot of role model and symbolisms. We do have a lot when it comes to the entertainment industry. And again, it's not a problem because you, can't, you cannot be intellectual all the time. You need to relax, you need to have fun. And having fun is actually good for your brain. It's actually good for your mind. You need to, we, Africa also needs like great painter. We need great musician, of course. But like Jaminal said, we have to be rational here. Has music ever developed a society? I, I leave it there to people to answer. Thank you. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you guys coming on. If there's anything else that you guys want to say, if you want to tell people where they can find you on social media, please do, and then we can let you guys go. Okay, thanks, Jaminal. Uh, okay, to, to conclude, I wanted to, 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 to say thanks to Liam again. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was very interesting, and I really like the casual and, and friendly vibe and style. It's very, very uh, refreshing. Thank you for having me here. Thank you also for Germinal for partnering with me into uh, 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 in writing actually this book. Uh, I am available in social network on Instagram and LinkedIn. My Instagram is actually Philip um, Philip Ado, and on LinkedIn you can use my full name Jean Philippe Ado. Um, and, and, and I'd be very happy to, 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 to receive your comment and feedback and very happy for you also to stay tuned because uh, I, will, I will actually um, publish my, my, my second book, which is going to be my first uh, solo book in, 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 in the coming months, not this year, but I promise I will, I will do so. Groundbreaking again, man. Always groundbreaking. That's all we do. We don't play around. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> African excellence. I'll have Promoting. to have you on again. Thank you. Well, well, Liam, thank you very much for having us, for having me. It's my second intervention on, on your platform. It's, it's always an honor, of course. Uh, I want to thank also my dear friend, Jean-Philippe Sika Ado, who has done an outstanding work in in the production of this book. I have to be honest with you, Liam, I would have not been able to write this specific book. I mean, I write books, you know me, I write books a lot, but this book, I wouldn't be able to make it as deep and as scientific and groundbreaking like it is without the output of Jean-Philippe. It's impossible. Sika has done an, an extra, extraordinary work. He's one of the brightest men that I ever met. To actually argue with him, you need to be ready. <laughs> I have to say, he's he's a very, I mean, when I say argue, like not not in the Bible, but just to have a, a conversation, just to have a debate, an intellectual debate, you have to be ready because he's very very analytical, very analytical, very technical in his approach to every subject that we discuss. So it's so you have to get your response ready for it. But it it was a great partnership I had with him and. We have a couple projects ahead to work. So this is just the beginning of a very long, long, long collaborative uh, partnership that we will have in the following years to come. Um, I'm going to publish another book very soon, the last one of the year 2020. That is, of course, this is me uh, solo, back to my soloness, because I want uh, Sika to uh, to work on his own project too that he's been contemplating for a while. So he's going to dedicate his time to that until the finalization of, of, the, of the project. So people can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, but mainly Instagram, that's where I do most of the marketing and the promotion. Facebook, it's more like just for friends, talking, and YouTube, this is more for my videos, educational purposes, and uh, yeah, pretty much that's uh, that's that's all for that's all for me. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Like, sorry, sorry, guys. I would also like to just uh, remind the readers that the book is still available uh, on Amazon, uh, paperback version and electronic yes. Kindle version. So we'd be very happy for you to get your copy. It is a scientific book that it's a must read. 
I, I really insist it's a must read. And, 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 and again, it wasn't written from, from a complaining perspective. So for those who really love scientific books, who love uh, rationality, it is going to be um, very interesting for you to, to read it. And again, to share your, 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 your feedback, your, your impression, to tell us where we fell short, uh, where we also did a great job. I think we need that because obviously the proposal is not perfect. There's always room for improvement, but we can never know if without your feedback and your comments. So the book is still available and we really appreciate if you can get a copy for yourself and read it and enjoy it. Thank you. And I'll definitely link to the book um, under the show so people can access it easily. So, thank but you. yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much. Yep. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank okay. you. Bye. Thank you. It's the weekend, we can let go. It's the full send, it's the get go. It's the get go, get go. Still not as clean as a bank account screen on. Not really, though. You were probably jealous of me when I don't have a lot of money. But I've got a full bread box and some honey.